How many are, are cat people? Prefer your cats? Well, there's a book called Cat and Dog Theology. I had to read it in, in college. And the, uh, the author must have been a person who had a cat and dog. Because you can look a dog in its eyes, and you can see, man, that dog loves me. <laughs> you feed a dog, you pet a dog, you, like, it knows. You feed me. You let me go outside. You love me. You must be God. <laughs> A cat, on the other hand, the, the, the eyes say it all, right? You know, that slow blink of like, I can't stand you. <laughs> it, it thinks, you feed me, you clean out my litter box, you buy me toys after I knock your stuff off the countertop. I must be God, because you serve me. And you see it, right? You can see that in a cat and a dog. And I, maybe that's why all those cats ended up on those Egyptian hieroglyphics. Not many dogs, right? <laughs> but in our relationship with God, are you a cat or are you a dog? Do you think that God should be there at your beck and call? God feeds me. God provides for me, God blesses me, God heals me, God works for me. Or are you like a dog? God feeds me, God provides for me, God loves me, God blesses me, God heals me. I would do anything for God. Malachi is dealing with people that have the wrong perspective on God. We're going to be in Malachi 1 today. We're going to go kind of verse by verse for the first half of the sermon. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, right before Matthew. One six, Malachi 1 6. He says, A son honors his father. And a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? If God is the father, if God is the creator, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest who despise my name. The people who were in the church, especially the people running the church, had stopped caring about God. And you see, honor, honor is a neat word in Hebrew because in certain places, it's translated glory. Where's, where's the glory that you give me? And in other places, it's translated as a burden because it is something heavy. Honor weighs more. Whenever you're evaluating what you should do, honor tips the scale in, in favor of what should be honored. This isn't necessarily directly related to my sermon, but I thought it was just too neat to pass up. That parents, you are cooperating with God. God is allowing you to be involved in creating something new. Whenever you have a child, you have helped God create something. Isn't that neat? And that's why parents deserve special honor. Because they have worked alongside with God in creating something new. And a servant is master. So we've got we've got home and we've got work. And aren't those about the only two things that there are? There's other times, you know, there's 
there's travel and there's fun and there's, but those things are really just a sliver of the pie whenever we think about it. So God's saying at home and at work, where is the devotion that you have to me? Fear is really respect. Because you are afraid of a lion. Because you respect its power. And that is immensely important with God. Do you understand his power? Do you understand his capabilities? I don't think we can, to the fullest of our knowledge, but do you know what he's capable of? Do you know what he says he's capable of? And yet the priests still despised his name. And despised means worthless. The priests considered God worthless. The people that were leading the nation of Israel, they had a governor from Persia, but, but really the people who were involved in the daily life, who were leading them spiritually and politically, did not care. Verse 7. By offering polluted food upon my altar. So how have you despised my name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. Malachi is all about asking questions. And so... To the best of my ability, every point that I have is going to be a question. Because you can tune me out, right? You can, you can say, okay, well, Josh is, Josh is telling me what to do. I might be good at telling people what to do, but getting people to do what I want to do, want them to do, is a different, uh, different subject. So I'm just going to ask you questions. And you can come to your own conclusions. So our first question today, what is God's worth in your eyes? Would God say they despise my name? Would God say they honor my name? Would God say they fear my name? Our culture is not necessarily, like you can be gung-ho about certain things. But as far as God goes, I'd say we're lukewarm at best. You know, it's good to believe in God, but don't let it influence your political views, your, your, the way you live your life, the way you accept other people. Just believe in God and that's enough. That's worthless. So how do you demonstrate God's worth? Personally. Last week we talked about what you love. And I don't think it's a coincidence that God goes into this after saying, I love you. Where is your love for me? Because what follows a lack of love? Not being treated in a worthy manner. Whenever you don't love something, you don't take care of it. Think about work. If they're, like, I work in construction, you guys know this, like, any, any trade job, most of the time, the only person who cares about the tools is the boss. <laughs> Where's the tools at? Well, I don't know. This guy put it up, so who knows where it's at? They don't care. They just throw stuff around. You know, I might get left on the job. I might have might got left in, in a different trailer. Who knows? Because the employees don't care as much about what's going on as the, as the owner. Do you take ownership of your relationship with God? Do 
you take ownership of any of your relationships? What do you love? What do you consider worthy of your, of your heart, of your time, of your effort? This isn't an easy sermon for me. <laughs> I don't, I, man, this is, this is heavy. And I was not looking forward to preaching this sermon. And it doesn't get any better, guys. <laughs> it, it gets harder. So what is God's worth in your eyes? Well, let's look at the first half of verse 8. When you offer blind animals... In sacrifice is that not evil and when you offer those that are lame or sick is that not evil is God just getting your leftovers is God getting ah, well I'm not busy this morning I'll go to church I'm pretty tired but I haven't prayed today, so I might as well pray and fall asleep while you're praying. Is God getting the leftovers? Is God getting the scraps from the table? Is God sitting in heaven wondering why I give them Blessings and blessings. I give them all that they have. I created this beautiful world for them to live in. I gave them passions to enjoy. It's like dealing with children. They don't even understand what's special. And they chase these other idols. They chase what's in, just going to end comfort, entertainment, luxury, popularity. What is getting the first fruits of your effort? It's real quiet in here. <laughs> Verse 8b. Present that to your governor. Now, Persia had taken over the Babylonian Empire, let them be self-governing, but there was still expected to be gifts and offerings presented to the governor. And it would literally, you'd prepare it, you'd take it to the governor, and he would eat it for supper. Will he accept you or show you favor? Says the Lord of hosts. If you give the governor a diseased, blind, lame animal, is he going to accept that? If you give your best to anything else, why can't you give it to God? That's our second question today. To what or to whom are you giving your best? What is actually getting the majority of your effort? The majority of your... You know what? God doesn't even ask for the majority. God just asks for the best. You know? He, said, he gives us 100% of our our money. He says, you keep 90. 90%. Just give me the first 10. And this isn't a tithing sermon. You guys are awesome about giving. But he says, give me that best 10. In the Old Testament, he said, give me a young male as spotless. Because these animals were animals they didn't want in the herd. You got a blind one, you got a sick one, 
You got one that can't move. We'll just get rid of that one anyway. So I'm available right now. I haven't. So I'll go ahead and do what God wants me to do. But if I was busy, it'd be a different question. There was a new believer in Africa. I came across this while I was researching. She was totally new to the faith. She had never been to church before, and so she went, and they passed the plate around. She had no idea what was going on, but she saw people reaching in their pockets, they were getting money out, they were putting it in the plate, and she realized, like, I don't have any money. So she took the plate, she put it in the aisle, and she stood in the plate. She said, I don't have any, any money, but God can have all of me. If we pass the plate, someone takes the plate, steps in the aisle, steps in the plate, you know, probably some piece of plastic. <laughs> what would you think? Man, that girl's weird. She doesn't know what's going on here. That's not what we do in church. Or would you think, man, I wish I could believe like that. I wish I could not care what people are going to think. Because that, that's not normal. What are you giving yourself to? Is it work? Is it family? Is it a hobby? Maybe, maybe you don't even realize what, maybe it's just whatever comes up. Because there isn't really a plan. You just go with the flow. And I go with the flow, trust me. <laughs> I, it's a good thing I have Mariah to keep me on track. Because otherwise it'd be like, well, yeah, I watched TV for a couple hours this morning. And uh, I ate some food. And that's what I gave myself to today, you know? But God doesn't want that either. Because what really that, that means is you're giving yourself to yourself. That my comfort, my entertainment, my pleasure is what matters most. And so, analyze. Because we're going to see this is not a good situation to be in. God has bad words to say to these people. And I don't want that for you. I don't want that for any of us. And I really don't want to be the pastor who God says, Joshua, Joshua Blade, like my mom, <laughs> why did you let those people do that? Because they were following your example. I don't want to be cursed by God. And I don't want you guys to be cursed for God, before God. God already knows where it's going. God knows where your heart is. He just needs you to see it. Let's go to verse 9. And now, so after you've given these offerings, now you entreat the favor of God that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show you favor? Will he show favor to any of you? Says the Lord of hosts. Well, like I said, God knows our hearts. But especially when we ask for something. Especially when we offer something to him. He inspects us. It's not that we can earn God's merit. God is full of grace, full of mercy. Grace is unmerited favor. But take kids, for example. If a kid, you've told them, you know, you need to go clean your room. You need to clean your room. I'm getting some eye rolls. <laughs> we know where this is going. You need to clean your room. I'm telling you one last time. 
You need to clean your room. Why? Because I said so. It doesn't matter. Just do it. It's going to be good. I'm training you to take care of things in the future. Clean your room. And on the eighth try, after being sent to bed for a while, no TV, no dinner, they finally reluctantly shove everything in the closet under the bed. And they say, it's clean. <laughs> but, Karen, I have some ice cream. I clean my room. And you're like, your room is still not clean. Are you going to reward this kid for being distracted? Are you going to reward this kid for wanting what it wants, but not wanting to do what you ask? And now you entreat the favor of your parents who buy all the groceries. Be gracious, give me ice cream. How much are we like kids? You know, we grow up and we think we got it all figured out. You know, well, I don't have to clean my room because I'm an adult and I can treat it the way I want. And I can eat ice cream because I bought it. And God's in heaven saying, you wouldn't have any of that if it wasn't for me. And I just ask you, honor my name. Respect my name. Love your neighbor as yourself. Teach people to obey my commands. The bar is high, but God understands we can't reach the bar by ourselves. So he gives us a spirit. I'll even help you. How many people have helped some one of their kids clean their room? I've asked you, and now I'm going to help you do it. I've had a lot of help in my room. <laughs> but God knows. God knows where you're hiding stuff. God knows where all your time is spent. God knows where your heart is gone. But like Levi said, you still have value. He still loves you. He still cares about you, regardless of all that. But he says... How can I bless you when you act like I'm not even a part of your life? And this is not the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. There is always going to be hard times. But God makes everything. Verse 10. Oh, that there were one of you, one among you, who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle the fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. Now, this kind of, this is like, God would prefer that the church be closed than for people to bring an offering that disgraces God. So in my mind, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm thinking about this. I'm, I'm just sitting in Mariah's office at Sage Industrial <laughs> while she's wiring pants, and I'm pondering, I'm pondering, what does this look like? So I decided we're going to start putting Billy at the front door. And if you sleep or if you don't sing, he's not letting you in. <laughs> if you don't get along with everybody else, if you're not nice to people, you're not on the list. <laughs> He'll let new people in because they haven't, they haven't, we don't know about them yet. But... Billy the Bouncer. <laughs> no greeters, just people who turn away. What would you think if you walked up to a new church, never been there before, 
And there's a guy with a list. Uh, let's see your name on the list. Lucky for you, this is a prohibiting list. You can go in. You'd be like, this church is weird. They got some mess. How many bad people are in this church? None, because I didn't let them in. <laughs> <laughs> but really, you think there's some bad people in this church. Or, that's a bad church. They don't know what they're doing. Church wants more people. It doesn't matter what those people are like. It doesn't matter if they call themselves a Christian on Sunday, but cuss like a sailor on Monday, right? Because church just wants more numbers. God says, close the doors. Even the few faithful people. I'd rather everybody be shut up. Don't light the fire. He's talking about the altar, but maybe we just kill the heat. <laughs> you know? Do you bring complaining and criticism and gossip into the church? Do you make the church look bad? I don't care about the building. The building Christian church. We're just talking capital C church. Because we are the representatives of God. People say, you know, I don't go to church because of church people. I'd go to church if it wasn't for church people. <laughs> well, that makes sense. <laughs> you want to go to an empty building? But that's our fault. Because we continue. So the next question is, why do you go to church? Why do you go? <coughs> this just goes against every fiber of my being. <laughs> I want you guys to come. But I want you to come for the right reasons. Do you roll out of bed and say, well, I gotta go to church because this person's gonna bug me if I don't go. Or better go, otherwise I'm gonna feel guilty. I better go because this is what we always did growing up. I better go because Josh will text me and I don't know what to say. <laughs> Why do you come? Maybe you just like having a little time with some people. But is there any part of you that just likes having a little time with God? And I think you can, I think the church part of our existence is that we get to relate to one another in a way that God wants to relate to us. So, if that's part of the motivation, that's good. Because we should love one another. We should give mercy. We should not just pick each other apart, but give allowances for one another's faith. Faults. So I hope that you get some enjoyment from relating to the people here. But I hope that you also come with a sincere respect for God. Because when we sing, we're not just singing because Mariah is so good at it. You know, it's not just a concert. It's not just a coffee house setting. This is our chance to come together and sing to God. To reflect on the words of the songs. Like that song, Rescue. 
God hears our whispers. God hears our SOSs. Even whenever it seems the darkest, God is there. He'll never stop fighting. He'll never stop marching. I want to cry. <laughs> These are opportunities for us to say thank you, God. I love you. You mean so much to me. And to be reminded that even in the darkest times, you can come here and you can experience some light. Let's do more than one verse this time. We'll go 11 through 14. For the rising of the sun to its setting my name will be great among the nations, and in every place incense will be offered to my name, and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. But you profane it when you say that the Lord's table is polluted, and its fruit, that is, its food may be despised. But you say, what a weirdness this is. You snort at it. The Lord, says the Lord of hosts, you bring what has been taken by violence, basically stolen, or is lame or sick, and this you bring as your offering. Shall I accept that from your hand, says the Lord? Cursed be the chief who has a male in his flock, and vows it, and yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. So our next question. So what if you just don't care? What if, after all this, it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter what God wants, it doesn't matter what God thinks, you're just going to go about your week the same as you always have. Verse 14 said that my name will be feared among all the nations. And there's a reason. You know, it's whether you are a Christian or whether you're a non-Christian, God requires everything. God knows it's going to cost you everything. Regardless of the way you move. He says, for, the follow for my followers, take up your cross every day. You're not going to live the way that you desire to live. Comfortable, entertain, you know, just living for yourself. You don't get to do that. Take up your cross. It's going to cost you everything. But for the people who don't take up their cross, their cross. <laughs> for the people who don't take up their cross, it still costs everything, right? They just say, oh, I'll just wait and see. Christians, we, we, we're like, we'll pay it off soon. We'll, we'll just, we'll, it'll cost us everything in this life. Because for the people who don't believe, it costs everything in the next. It's hell. We should fear God because he is holy. And that he will accept nothing but holiness. Unless the price has already been paid. And so, hell. is a great reason to be afraid. Because God's value doesn't really matter. 
what you think. It's not like supply and demand. Like, oh, okay, well, I've got a skill and the going rate for that skill is $45 an hour. So that's what people are willing to pay. But if that skill is only worth $10 an hour, that's all you're gonna get. The value is totally dependent upon the market. Currency goes up and down, value of gold, stocks, all these things fluctuate just based upon how much we want it. God's value, there is no supply and demand. God's value is intrinsic. God is valuable, period. So it's up to us to give God that worth in our hearts, to recognize God's worth, to appraise God and act accordingly. And so I hope that you count the cost. I hope that you see God is the best return. There's no fluctuation. Because for those who love him, he gives heaven. He gives everything. We're going to be some happy dogs in heaven. No fleas. No getting hit by cars. A little ginger. Three-legged dogs. Ain't going to be no three-legged dogs in heaven. <laughs> and so I hope, evaluate. Think about why. Think about what is at the center of your life. What are you giving the most worth? And if you don't know right now who Jesus is, why are you waiting? I say it every week. Come talk to me. Why don't we go ahead and stand? God is the most valuable thing that there is. A relationship with Jesus is the most valuable thing that there is. If you've never been baptized, if you've never entered into that relationship, with Jesus Christ. Don't wait any longer. I'll pray and you'll be dismissed. Father God, help us to, to see your worth. Help us to look at our lives and see what we're giving. God, I pray that you will open up our hearts, open up our minds, open up our eyes. Every day. That we might bless you. That we might do what you want us to do the first time you ask it. And God, I pray that you will bless these people for their effort. God, hope, help us to Show your love to the people around us. Help us to bring good offerings to you. God, thank you so much for Jesus. That he paid our price. That we can come to you. It's in his name we pray.